All right. Um, well, Daria McKelvey, Adam Smith, welcome to For Sales All Around the Yard. And for all of the, the, those listening, uh, Daria McKelvey is the supervisor for the Center of Home Gardening at the Missouri Botanical Gardens. And Adam Smith is the associate scientist in global uh, change at the Center of Conservation and Sustainable Development at the Missouri Botanical Gardens as well. Got that right, correct? Yes. Sounds good. Excellent. Excellent. So the conversation uh, really that we're going to have today is around climate change uh, and at a local level. And so I went through some of the prep that uh, Katie had put together and some of the questions and I was pretty intrigued by uh, the conversation. And so I guess why don't, why don't we start with, why don't you guys give a little background? Uh, Dari, if you wouldn't mind starting first, kind of your background at the uh, Daniel Garden, how long you've been there and kind of how you got interested in the uh, climate change side of uh, what, what you guys do at the garden. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Daria McKelvey. Um, I've been at the garden now three years and love it. Um, I also am a huge plant nerd. So this is just like heaven for me, work, uh, working around plants and other people who are interested in this. Um, with climate change, how I'm kind of getting into it is because we have answer services that we take questions from all across the state from home gardeners. They're just asking about, you know, what's wrong with my plants, uh, disease issues and that kind of thing. And so um, I'm kind of attuned to what, you know, what their concerns are, what, what's happening in uh, their own yards. And some of the things that I've been hearing, you know, can tie into uh, how our climate is changing. Um, and thinking about how we can help homeowners to uh, mitigate those changes uh, to what to be aware of, um, those kind of things. And then also we have, which I'll talk about later, a little climate garden um, that kind of also addresses some of those concerns. So it's all kind of interconnected and that's how I'm connected with or um, looking at climate change. All right, awesome. Uh, Adam, what about yourself? Well, uh, so I'm a scientist at the garden and I'm interested in the same kind of things that Daria as well. Uh, in particular, the science, the, the garden has a large conservation program focused on plants regionally plus across the world. And one of the things I help look at is which plants should we be concerned about? Um, uh, should we be focusing on this plant or that plant? There's honest, the sad fact is that there are just too many um, rare plants already. Uh, and uh, once you throw climate change into the mix, then it becomes far worse conservation-wise. So I, let me pull on that thread real fast because that, I mean, that's, that's interesting. Um, I grew up on a tree farm. I you know, grew, up in the, grew up in the business. Uh, so I'm kind of, I guess, numb in some cases to, some, to cert, certain aspects of it. But what do you see um, as a species of, of plant material that you know, are the biggest concerns uh, that maybe the average homeowner might need to uh, be aware of or anything along those lines? I would say I can't point to specific species that because um, we're still trying to understand the effects of like, you know, uh, climate change on the ones that we currently go in the garden. But I mean, it's going to affect the types of annuals, shrubs, trees, everything you grow, essentially. Um, you, you know, there are going to be um, with temperatures warming up, there are going to be some plants that can be a little bit more adapted to those warmer temperatures, but then there's going to be a lot of plants that, you know, may not survive as well. So it's going to be, it's going to affect everything essentially. And so in the, in the landscape world, uh, I mean, the heat island effect that they had down the city where you can maybe get away with a few more crepe myrtle and, and uh, cherry laurels and stuff. And you go out towards Wentzville, eh, maybe not, not, not recommended. Um, you're definitely starting to see a little bit more as you, you can go adventure a little further west with some of the plants that, that we've seen. I still like taking a chance with them just because the cold snaps we can get. Mm -hmm. But uh, also hollies. Hollies have just been horrible. Uh, I, I won't even plant uh, upright hollies anymore just because uh, the, we get these extreme heat drought, droughts that we're getting out. And all of a sudden these extreme cold snaps and I, they get so defoliated that... Uh, I, that's one of the biggest plants that I know it's literally we're having a buying strategy meeting right now. We're just saying, get rid of all of them. I don't want, I don't want mm -hmm. to deal with them ever again. We used to have foster hollies in our fields. Uh, we had a cold snap uh, three years ago. It was just well, well, on that six, seven years ago. And it was dry. It took our entire, every row of foster holly out. We used to grow them all over the place. Uh, so we, we, we finally just said we're done, we're done with hollies. That, that is one I can definitely hang my hat on and say that there's some climate change, uh, 
has, that's one plant I believe is affecting. Oh yeah, in, uh, St. Louis City, and I'm talking about the city, not the greater region. St. Louis City has actually warmed up by about five degrees since the 1970. Oh, so wow. it is a big difference. And I mean, you probably noticed too. Um, say in the fall, trees will start turning colors here about two weeks before they do out in in the Ozarks. So it, it's in a sense we are in a different climate zone right here in the city compared to just a couple miles away. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I've heard it described as even like zone more closer to a zone seven. We're six in this region, but maybe the seven is more uh, more for the St. Louis re met metro region. That's interesting. I that definitely changes the game when it comes to you know people like us in the garden center business where we're way out in St. Charles County, but yet we have a lot of clients and, and it just it adds a whole other zone to everything that to uh, be contemplating when we're when we're designing landscapes and designing gardens and giving people advice on what to do with plant material. Mm -hmm. it's, so with what you guys are doing at the garden, I guess, can you describe some of the, some of these climate gardens that you guys are working with and some of the things that maybe are, you guys are, are testing? I, I'm, I'm intrigued by this. I'm very interested. Yeah, sure. Um, this is the, so there's a climate, so in the Center for Home Gardening, first of all, we have 23 different demonstration gardens. So we have a vegetable garden, um, a bird garden, a uh, prairie garden, those kind of, you know, little unique areas. But one is the climate garden, and it's in our trial area. And we jokingly call this place the plants, the place where plants go to die. Um, and we say that because we're testing out plants that normally would not be in a St. Louis hardiness zone. So anything seven to 10. Okay. So we, we, we're not too hopeful on a lot of stuff. Actually, if the plant dies over the winter, that's kind of a good thing because that means that they're not sticking around, you know. Um, but we're just seeing, you know, what, uh, you know, what can, if there's anything that can survive. So we leave a plant in there for three years. If it survives to three years, um, we leave it in there. And then after on the fourth year, we will dig it up and actually place it in another part of the garden to see if it, you know, continues to have that heart, you know, withstand those uh, hardiness zones. Um, and we've had a couple that actually we've planted in uh, different areas. So uh, we've got a couple in our woodland garden in our Chinese garden um, and they're, you know, they're still alive. So it's interesting to kind of see that uh, happen. Um, you know, you don't expect it. We've got, um, I'll give you an example of one that's doing two or that are doing really, really well is the calla lilies, the Xanthodesia. Uh, we have a, a yellow cultivar and a white cultivar and they are looking fantastic right now. Um, and so they're, I think, getting close to their third year. So we'll be moving those out soon. And also I think it's a Colocasia. Uh, the cultivar, I think, is Pink China. That's a zone eight. Those have come back every year for the past couple of years. And so um, we'll probably move those out to a different location in the garden, see how well they do, and uh, make note of that. Hi, Daria, I'm curious. Do you happen mm -hmm. to know, are there observations of change in problematic or species that have become problematic because of climate? And mm. I'm thinking, honestly, in particular, is kind of a... a personal example. So my neighbor has a bunch of um, native bamboo. And my understanding is up until like the 80s, it wasn't really a problem because every winter get knocked back. Mm -hmm. Now it's not knocked back so much. And it is, he would describe as a problem. It was really kind of taking over the yard. Mm -hmm. um, Eastern red cedar might be another similar one. They're, they're native, but they're becoming more aggressive. Yeah. I haven't heard of any particular species doing that. I mean, that's an interest. I mean, that is to be expected too. Um, as part of warming temperatures, things are going to become more problematic. Um, I do know that the like the native bamboos, like they're slower growing, but even then they still have aggressive growth. So you still have to be careful with those. Yeah. But I'm sure we'll probably, that's one of the concerns is that we'll probably start seeing more plants like that. And particularly if it's an invasive species. Um, with more warming temperatures, they're going to be able to have a wider range, and then we have more, you know, problems of that as well. So, that, I mean, what you so you're saying? So, if I heard that correct, the uh, native red cedars are actually becoming more aggressive with the uh, warming temperatures. Yeah, in that case, it's actually <laughs> ironically linked to uh, better air quality um, through the Clean Air Act. Um, and uh, what they do is they encroach on these really kind of rare, but um, they're common in Missouri, but they're, they're worldwide rare uh, glades. And glades tend to harbor a lot of mm -hmm. unique species in this area. So the trees will crowd out these smaller plants and then you don't have a glade anymore. You have a forest basically. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, that's one of those weird things where like, yes, it's something good and it had this knock on effect of maybe something that's, that's not so desirable. Yeah. 
I've heard that? that growing up, like actually, uh, I wouldn't, I don't know directly tied to climate change, but I know that that plant has been growing quite a bit in terms of its range. I, in the Southwest, it's becoming an issue too. Hmm. Could be. That's interesting. So I mean, is it, is, are they are they worried about how aggressive it's getting, or and I mean, it just because I mean, I, I I grew up around Cedar Rapids, St. Charles County, and uh, driving through bush wildlife, and we see it everywhere out here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess it requires more management, proactive management on the um, mm -hmm. part of Missouri Department of Conservation and and in state parks as well, uh, just to keep them from encroaching on these glades. So with with any of the native plants, I mean, what is there anything you guys can hang a hat on? Like this is definitely something that's that's an impact from a climate change standpoint from any maybe native species, whether it's at the garden or, or in any other areas that I know gardens might have a partnership with that you guys have seen. Uh, you know, there was, uh, this is really interesting. Um, there is a botanist here at the garden in the 30s uh, who would go out to what is now Shaw Nature Reserve. Mm -hmm. And he, every day, um, I think maybe once a, once, once one day a week or something like that for um, several summers in a row, he'd go around and record all the plants he saw flowering. And then that was repeated in the 60s and that's repeated more recently by some other uh, people here at the garden and, um, and at local institutions. And what they found is a lot of those plants are blooming earlier in the year. And not only that, there tends to be more overlap in what is flowering. And so um, uh, I'm working with uh, Matthew Austin, who's a postdoc at Washington University in St. Louis, to examine whether pollen is um, being inadvertently transferred from one species to another species. And of course, that is a, generally a bad thing because uh, you know pollen from species A can't pollinate species B, but it might interfere with uh, species be reproducing. So he's examining that. So it, it's interesting. We, we have these local records. And if you know where to look for them, you can find evidence of climate change over the last, you know, 40, 50, 60, 80 years. Mm -hmm. so that, that, I mean, that comment you just had there with, you know, species trying to, I mean, you know, can't cross pollinate other species. I mean, these are things that I said myself growing up in the field that you just take for, I mean, you just know that for a lot of plant species, that's what happens. But uh, for the average homeowner, they don't understand, I guess, really the intricacies of the plant kingdom, if you will, and how things how things actually how things actually you know need to happen, and how the climate's changing, and how it's impacting the potential um, regeneration of, of you know whether it's we're talking about sclade a minute ago and the, the encroachment of the cedars or any of the other things like that. So, I mean, is there any like macro level um, situations where you know actually besides the red cedars on the glades that that you guys are seeing? um potentially some some bigger impacts locally or even afar i can't point to anything on the macro level but i mean kind of going on what we were just talking about to expanding like not only if you're blooming earlier with your plants like this is going to this is not just a trend that's going to be seen here but it's going to be go all over is that if plants are blooming earlier, that means that they're, there's going to be a mismatch between them and their pollinator. And so it's going to be a, a negative. Gotcha. So if the plant blooms earlier uh, and it's finished, the, you know, the insect emerges and it's going to be like, okay, where's my food? I have nothing to go on. So not only is that going to affect the plant because now the plant is not going to be pollinated by its um, pollinator. That means that there's going to be less fruit and seed set, which means there's going to be less chances of pro new progeny for the next generation on the plant part of the pollinator, um, you know, they're not going to have the nectar or food sources that they need. They're not, you know, they're going to could essentially starve or um, you could have a large buyout of the population. And so that's just going to keep continuing if, if those things don't, you know, continue to stay in cycle as they are right now. So that's, that's what's the concern is for not just our native plants, but just any plants all across the world. No, that made no, that made that made a ton of sense. No, I, I completely I, now now I, now I understand. That that makes yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I remember uh, driving up to Chicago a few years ago and everything budding out in March because we had this this real early warm up. I'm like, what is going on? Uh, everything's starting to wake already. Plus, we're worried about the freezing. Like this year, we had a we had a we had a late freeze, uh, snow mm -hmm. and frost, and we had 55 gallon drums trying to keep our Japanese maples warm. <laughs> Uh, to keep them from getting frostbitten, and we did a pretty good job, as you can see, where we didn't do so good too. So that's that's the other thing. You're, everybody's seen a lot more this year, more than anything else. Um, the, I mean, the late frost that we that we're prone to getting still. 
uh, and everything was getting damaged this year. There's a lot of damage you still see everywhere. Yep. Uh, the boxes are just now fluffing out in some cases, depending on where they're, where they're located at. Um, but I mean, that's another thing that's going to, to cause a lot. Of, I, mean, I see causing a lot of issues um, in not just the landscape industry, but just in the environment itself. I mean, mm -hmm. as far as the natives, I mean, have you seen a lot of that and anything like um, whether it's on any of the nature reserves or anything along those lines? Hmm. Um, I'm not, I can not speak to that specifically. One, just going off of one observation. So like I did go out to the nature reserve uh, not a week or so after that frost, maybe two, three weeks. Um, and I noticed that um, the ferns out there had, had taken a big hit in terms mm -hmm. of their leaves. And of course we know that they can regenerate their leaves, which they did, and that was fine. But that means that if, they're, if our fr freezes are like more infrequent or they're coming at a later time, you could think of that um, they're going to have to expend more energy into putting on a second set of leaves, which is not ideal. Like, you know, no one wants to do spend more extra energy on a project, but they can, <laughs> um, they can do it, but it's just going to, you know, they're not going to have that energy to direct to other, you know, root growth or, you know, um, develop in other areas. So that's something that you could think of as a concern. Like if that keeps happening, you're going to have weaker plants and that could also invite uh, weaker plants could lead to, you know, increased pest issues, disease issues. It's, it's always this cascade. Every time you think of like, okay, here's the start and here's what's going to happen. It's just, it, it just goes downhill from there. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. If you get a lot of frost damage, you come off branches and all of a sudden branches are breaking and you've got a lot of open wounds that, yeah, absolutely makes a lot more susceptible mm -hmm. to pests and diseases. Uh, makes makes our jobs harder, uh, yes. I guess. It gives, us, it gives a lot more work, but at the same time, you want to be working on beautiful landscapes, not rejuvenating landscapes. Mm -hmm. And even trying to explain to homeowners too, because like you know, we, like I said, we have an answer service, so we got a, a lot. We get a lot of calls about, oh no, like during the frost, everybody's Japanese maple was getting you know hit really bad, mm -hmm. and so um, you know you just start getting a lot of more questions, and then sometimes you know you can't explain it or it's just like, sorry, that's the weather. That's what happened. Uh, you know, that's not the answer you... they want. No, it's <laughs> but it's like, I can't control that. This is the, this is the current conditions. This is what it's doing. And you're, well, here's an example of climate change and why it's important to realize, you know, to recognize that this is happening. Yeah. yeah. You know, to hey, speak a little more to that effect, uh, you know, we're, we're calling it climate change. And I think that's good. Um, the somewhat older term is, is global warming um and that's fair too because yes overall the globe is warming but it's it really doesn't speak to what's happening it's more um i mean when we say climate change we mean climate disruption so yeah things are getting warmer on average but we also have weirder more erratic weather so like mm -hmm. these late cold snaps are much more damaging now because prior to the cold snap it was warmer than it normally would have been so plants get a head start on growth and then boom they get they get hit um so yeah, let's stick with the term climate change. <laughs> and even that's going to also affect, you know, even precipitation amounts too. Like, you know, there are going to be some regions that are going to get more, which means more flooding. Um, and there's a lot of re areas that are going to get less. Um, and then I was talking with one of our arborists, like, um, uh, you know, even the amount of, that falls at one time, you know, there's, it seems like there's, instead of these you know, slow mm -hmm. water rains, like kind of like we had this morning, which was really nice. Um, that allows time for that water to seep in and really get uh, deep into the root systems of plants, you know, there's going to be increases where you're going to have a huge pour down mm -hmm. and all that water is not going to have time to seep in, you know, correctly, a lot of it's going to evaporate. And so those plants like trees, think about it, are, are that, you know, adapted more to the slow rain type of uh, rainfall. And uh, if they're not going to be able to get as much water as they normally would from those rainfalls, then, then they're affected. You know, we might see some issues with tree die-offs. Yeah. Well, we saw. Oh, sorry. oh, that's right. Yeah, we saw. We saw this recently. We had that 100 degree heat. We didn't have rain for 10, 12 days, where it got just absolutely the ground was was ridiculous, like concrete basically. And then we didn't get slow rains. We had inch downpours in 20, 30 minutes, and it was just torrential downpours, and we had all this runoff. And everybody's like, oh, I'm done watering my plants. Thank God for the rain. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no, 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 no. You still need to put a hose out on that tree for the slow soak for several hours because that rain did nothing for you. <laughs> but it was so much water. It's like, I, I, I hear you. I can see why you think that. But that root ball is like, it's like a ball of concrete now. They have to 
you have to slowly take the water and expand back out and start to be able to absorb what what we're getting from uh, what, from the environment. So, seeing a lot more of those back and forth over the last four or five years, mm-hmm. a lot more of those. Um, and and you know, last night I was with a client where they're getting water in their basement because the, uh, the the way the water comes around the house, and they only have an inch gap from the pool deck up into the basement and um, I mean, I was like, look, whoever the pool contractor was just did not take into effect all the rain, heavy rains we're getting now. We're getting five year rains uh, three times a year now. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just uh, these are a lot of things that, you know, when you, when, from a designing a landscape standpoint that we look at from a drainage, drainage standpoint that people have to understand now, like, these are typical now. This isn't mm-hmm. once in a lifetime. These aren't once every five years. These are every year, multiple times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a pretty consistent prediction for climate models in the Midwest that just heavier deluges followed by are really kind of interspersed with long periods of no rain. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of the worst of both. Mm-hmm. So, so Adam, why, why don't you just talk to some of the, the, the mathematics side uh, of things and, I mean, with some of the models that you might be putting together or working on or interacting with. Uh, maybe, you know, is there anything predictive that you're looking at? Is there any trends that you guys are seeing through that? I mean, obviously we talked about some of the rain and the droughts and those kind of things, but is there anything that uh, you can speak to a, a little more in depth? Yeah, sure. Uh, so one of the things I do is I make mathematical models of what kinds of um, climates particular species like. And like I said earlier, I'm focused on species that are, are endangered or, or rare. Uh, and then we have projections from the future, and those projections are based on assumptions about what humans do. Like we emit a lot of greenhouse gases or we get our act together and don't emit a lot, whichever it is. Um, so I can take those models and project them to the future and see where the climate, you can imagine a map where you know it has a big blotch where uh, you know this, this particular species has the climate that it's like, that it likes. And then you can see where that kind of, that blob of climate that it likes moves up into the future. And um, a number of years ago, I was doing that for a couple of these Midwestern plants and I projected it to the year 2080 and I didn't see the blotch at all. Like I was looking around Missouri and Tennessee. And I was like, oh man, I, I did something wrong. Uh, so I went back and checked my code. Everything looked all right. And then I went back to the map and I zoomed out and there it was up in Canada. And mm-hmm. honestly, that was like one of the few times I've like pushed back from my desk in horror because it really hit me personally. I was like, do I want to be here? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I won't be here in 2080. I'll be 110 years old, but that's the future we're going to. And I started to wonder, you know, what will Missouri, what will St. Louis specifically look like in year 2050? Like what kind of climate will it have? So I actually use this model, these modeling techniques to figure out where the future climate of St. Louis is right now. And basically if we don't get our act together, um, St. Louis by the year 2080 could look like uh, Eastern Texas. And yeah, people live there, um, but it's a very, very different climate, very hot, um, much hotter than it is right now. Uh, so, you know, that that's kind of the, the future we're heading toward. And this is the kind of thing that I can use the models to help figure out. And we need to be planning for palm trees. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, and it's funny that he mentions that because we talked about this last time um, we did a little thing on climate uh, change, but I'm originally from West Texas. <laughs> So it's like the plants that I'm familiar with, I keep thinking like, hmm, they're gonna be up here maybe yeah. that time. <laughs> which, is, which is scary actually, which is a very scary thought. Um, to the fact that, you know, the plants that you're used to are not going to, are gonna, you know, be in a completely different range or location potentially. Yeah, that's one so- of the things, but well, I think your work really helps with dairy and that is figure out if plants need to go somewhere, how can they get there? And honestly, I mean, plants um, move, not, you know, picking up the roots and walking around, but they, they dropping seeds or getting seeds picked up by birds or whatever. So, you know, just by happenstance, they might go 50 feet this year and then a couple miles next year or something like that. Um, but it's just not fast enough to keep up with the, the rate of current climate mm-hmm. change. Uh, there's no way plants in Texas are gonna get up here in the next 80 years unless we help them out. Um, but it's, you know, there's so many plants, we can't just grab them all and bring them. We have to know which ones in particular are, are, are uh, susceptible. So have you seen in any instances where uh, plants might be naturally uh, becoming more uh, resilient to climate change? 
I haven't, I don't have any specific example, but I do know that, so, you know, several studies have said that, you know, plants that are at sort of the northern limit of their range are going to, um, they're probably the ones that are going to be benefit because the temperature will be warmer and they'll have more room to kind of move mm -hmm. in terms of spread, I should say. Um, so that is something to be expected. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot harder to, to examine whether plants are adapting or not than just to see if they're dying or they're surviving. But yeah, I know it's happening, but I can't pull up any. Yeah. yeah. And they, well, and also too, like, you know, for adaptations, it takes like hundreds, maybe even thousands of years mm -hmm. for them to, a plant to adapt to a different, you know, climate, whatever. And, uh, you know, that's, there will definitely plants now are not going to be able to keep up with it if we're moving, you know, by 20, like 2080, that's not far off. They're not going to have time to adapt to a new climate. It's going to be the survival of the fittest, essentially. Yeah, it's going to be a special problem for long live plants like trees versus annuals. You know, every year you get a chance to produce some that might survive in a warmer condition, whereas trees like, you know, in 80 years, the same tree will still be growing there, presumably, and it will not have necessarily had a, any chance to adapt. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, the only comment on that was like lantana. I had some in my house uh, a few years ago and it came back the next year in the pots. No water, <laughs> I just didn't do anything. It was pretty tough, as tough as nails, but winter did not kill it off. Didn't mm -hmm. do anything to protect it, just left it alone. Uh, I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, so that was, I mean, that's, again, kind of here's your sign <laughs> moment mm -hmm. of things are getting, things are getting a little warmer. We've um, seen that with cannas too. Yeah, I, I, around the garden. I don't know if you're seeing it, but like, um, yes, they can be affected a little bit by some of the colder temperatures. But if you site them in a place that, you know, like a brick house or, uh, you know, sidewalk or something, um, they're coming back. Like even one of our uh, one we have planted out in one of our beds, it's kind of in an open area. It came back this year, even though you're supposed to dig those out. Hmm. So. So with the rate that you guys are seeing the climate increase or the climate change increase by or warm up by um because we're talking about you know some of these trees like oak trees that have been here for two three hundred years uh you know think about these the things that have been around forever obviously the climate was changing slower but how do you how do you guys see maybe uh some of these just you know old trees adapting surviving through some of this or do you guys or have you guys seen any scenarios or situations where you know, these, you know, grandmas or great, great grandpas, 200 year old oak tree uh, start to really become impacted by a lot of the climate change. Not, not by storms, mainly just by the, by the heat uh, at the warming up. Hmm. You know, it is, um, many studies have shown it's the large trees in the forest that tend to kind of dominate whatever's going on. So I can't answer your question in particular, but when you lose the big trees, it really changes a lot of the, the landscape and the functioning of forests. So they are, um, they are a special concern. But oh, especially I mean, with all the clear cutting they're doing right now. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna hand, you know, they're older, they've undergone a lot more stress. So there's, you know, just the camel, the, the straw on the camel's back kind of thing. On the other hand, um, you know, usually the the youngest plants the seedlings are the ones that are most susceptible and once you get past that stage you're doing a lot better uh so i don't know honestly i can't say if if big trees are going to be better or worse off yeah. than compared to the smaller ones so if like one thing yeah go ahead, oh, go, ahead, go ahead i can mention one thing about it's um something i came across that was actually from the chicago botanic garden this is something they did in 2012 i think um they haven't I haven't seen the official data, but basically, uh -oh. I think they did like 50 trees and they ran some climate modeling to see how they would be, um, what species would be good in the future. Now, um, like, again, I don't know the bells and whistles of all this, but basically um, they said like about this uh, 2020, the uh, trees that were at the northern limit of their range would be okay, but by like 2050, I think about 20% of the trees from those original 50 would no, no longer find the Chicago region suitable. And then is it projected 2080, which is kind of what Adam talked about with other plants, that like only, you know, 11 of the 50 trees or something like that would actually still be 
uh, alive in the, the region. So um, that's just a, another warning, like, you know, thinking about towards the future that we're gonna probably lose a lot of trees, that there are gonna be many that are just not adaptable to those hotter, warmer climates or all the other stuff that comes with it. Um, that That's a telltale sign that that's gonna be the case. So um, I got a lot of questions. Uh, what, so like when it comes to climate change, obviously there's a big debate on what's causing climate change. Is climate change happening to the, to the, the level that's happening? And I totally believe that there's something going on. You can definitely see it. There's, it feels like uh, spring's coming earlier, uh, winter staying later, uh, winter lasts a little bit longer in some cases, but it's that weird warm, cold up, warm, cold up. And then it's, and it's you know, it's crazy. Um, what what do you think are all the contributors? Obviously, CO two uh, carbon is one of the, the biggest is the biggest known to uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. What do you guys start to see as big contributors to it? I mean, is there any ex, uh, external uh, environments? Maybe something like solar. I mean, I, I, I said solar winds or like the magnetic pole shifting and those kind of things. I mean, how much do you think that those might be contributing to some of the things going on too? Well. When we talk about climate change, again, maybe because we used to call it global warming, we usually think about temperature, but it's also precipitation, it's snow, it's, it's the patterns of those things, like does it, does it rain in, this, in the morning, does it rain in the afternoon, does it rain you know, all in big, one big dump, or is it spread out, that kind of thing. Um, but it's more than just temperature and that, and precipitation too. So like you just mentioned CO2, uh, it is true that plants eat CO2, carbon dioxide, and they need that. So there has been some speculation that not global warming, but climate change, speaking specifically about CO2, would actually help plants. And we actually have seen that um, across the world where, where plants have, have basically gotten bigger uh, because you know it's more plentiful now. Um, on the same hand, there's a limit to how much you can enjoy something of a good thing. Uh, CO2 is not a nutrient. So in a sense, we've been pumping the air full of, um, say we've been pumping the air full of Twinkies. Like, yeah, okay, you can get really big eating lots and lots of Twinkies, but you need other stuff like nitrogen and phosphorus and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, if plants don't have that, they can get bigger, but all, but at the same time, they might be able to um, defend their tissues less from, from herbivores and insects and things like that would be eating them. And that, that also has been demonstrated. So plants have actually, for crops, they've been shown that they've been getting less nutrient dense. So you can eat the same amount of, of whatever it is, rice or corn or something like that, but get net less nutrients. Same calories or more calories, but still. Um, so yeah, it's the, it's the twinkification of the atmosphere that, um, that can have an effect beyond just temperature and precipitation. With the loss of topsoil being a huge, I mean, and this is something that even myself, uh, I didn't realize it was really an issue it is, but the, the amount of erosion happening in the world, the amount of topsoil we're losing, and that's definitely uh, an area that, you know, that can hold uh, carbon in the soil. We're losing all this, and obviously this is what's allowing a lot of the plant, the plant material to thrive for crops, but a lot of the, the population relies on uh, for farming and food. Uh, how much does that impact um, the global climate change? That's a good question too. Um, I am from Kansas, and I know there are places where, like, you can go, and there's a a poll, and it says, you know, uh, 1920 the the soil, the top of the soil used to be here, and now it's where obviously you're standing, like, and it's feet. Wow. Um, so it's really striking. Uh, I mean, we're not in danger of running out of dirt in the world, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, 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 yeah. Still, uh, you know, it just makes a, a tough situation tougher. Um, I was actually just listening to a presentation earlier by one of my colleagues, and he was showing that a lot of the, the rare plants in the area and around the world really special relies on rare soils and we don't think about soil as something being different from here to there or whatever but there are some rare soils and the rarer the soil the more likely it is to have a rare plant that specializes only on that soil so uh, one example that's not kind of close to home is um, a system I used to work on it's it's a serpentine soil this is soil that's derived from rock that's basically poisonous, um, has high levels of heavy metals like nickel and stuff like that. And it's normally poisonous to plants, but some of them have adapted to live on that kind of soil. And some of them actually uptake, say, the nickel and store it in their cells. And then when something bites it, it gets a mouthful of nickel and says, I don't want this. Um, 
So it's really fascinating. And kind of the same thing here with glades. Glades, uh, cedar glades don't, they don't, they are not toxic in that sense, but there are a lot of plants that specialize on those kind of conditions and soils. So, uh, you know, in terms of preser preserving soil, uh, we, again, we tend to think of it as this monolithic, you know, just the dirt out there, but actually just little patches here and there of really rare soils that make a lot, um, uh, a big contribution to plant diversity. And the one way I can relate to that is I have a buddy in, in uh, Italy that owns a 300 year old vineyard. It's the only place in the world that the one grape grows is on the, uh, is on this, this mountain, uh, just on the, on the edge of the Italian Alps. Wow. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's, yeah, so, it's, I, I, so what you're saying, I, I, it makes a lot of sense. So, uh, so I mean, if people want to find out more about climate change, uh, you know, and what you know, botanical gardens are doing to inform people or giving people suggestions on what they can do to kind of fight it, um, I guess what, especially on a local level, where are some resources that people can go to? Um, there's a couple of websites. Uh, I was actually kind of on them. I know that the EPA and the USDA have really good. Uh, put together or like a almost a, it looks like a website presentation essentially and it explains the effect of climate change and it covers all areas not just plants but health uh, air quality everything and it gives a really detailed descriptions of um, you know how those uh, you know those areas are going to be affected um, I'm trying to think the uh, and also uh, NOAA in uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric administration. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, they also, I mean, if you're looking for climate data, they they've got it. You know, they they're the ones that are are driving a lot of the um, maps and data that we're seeing in terms of how things have changed over time. So definitely check out those websites. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's 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 great. And that, what do you guys have anything you guys want to add? That maybe I missed. Uh, I throw in climate central just as a more kind yeah. of general world like climate stories kind of thing. I I will say like. It is possible to get very depressed <laughs> thinking about this. And, you know, like for myself, I won't live to see 2080, but, you know, my, my child hopefully will. i um, wondering what kind of world he's going to live in. Um, and uh, I, I've had to think about this a lot because, you know, we're dealing with plants that some of them are on the brink of extinction. And honestly, in some cases, there's nothing you can do about. So I guess the way I think of it is you try to be a good doctor um, and, explain that to explain that uh, you know there are basically two kinds of bad doctors one's overly sensitized like you know you're in the emergency room bleeding the bad doctor comes in and she says oh my god i can't stand it blood you're like you don't want that doctor because that's just going to freak you out more um but you also don't want the kind of doctor who comes in and, and just totally bored doesn't look you in the eye doesn't say anything just starts going to work like they're desensitized to, to too much and so I think it's important to try to stay between those two where like you're sensitized enough to care, but desensitized enough to keep caring versus mm -hmm. just turning off. And I, I don't think it's a, um, I used to think it was a balance. Like you're trying to stay in the middle, trying to stay in the middle, but I actually think it's healthier to, to go between those. Like I said earlier, uh, you know, I was making those models of where that species uh, climate will go maybe in the future and it went up to Canada and I had a horrified response. And I think that's appropriate. Um, you know, if I had just been like, oh, okay, that's interesting, you know, that, that would have been too desensitized. Like, I, you actually need to, to be desensitized sometimes, and you need to be kind of overly sensitized sometimes, and it's the average that I think makes you healthy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that's my little t uh, psychological spiel on how to handle all this. Uh, it, it, it makes like a that. lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a really good way to put it. Because um, like you said, it, it's depressing. Like, I've given a presentation on like pollinators before and everything I came across was just pollinators are going to decline. It was just negative, negative, negative. I'm like, there's positive to this. And it was yeah. really, it was really depressing. Um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, there are still things that we can do. Like, even if it's in your backyard, like the one thing I would say for like home gardeners, there are things that you can do. It may, you know, it's not going to, you're not going to have a cape and save the entire world. But even if you can do something small in your own backyard or, you know, your own community garden plot or whatever, you know, you're still contributing to making things better or helping, you know, maybe you're helping a, a pollinator, a bee or wasp or even a fly or moth, you know, have some kind of resource that it, it can't find elsewhere. So there are still some benefits to that as well. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I uh, had a good conversation. Uh, Names are drawn in blank right now, but through the uh, Missouri Extension, uh, talking about pollinator gardens and um, you know how big of an impact that people can actually make on a small scale, and not having to do a whole lot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and what's really kind of just a silver lining then, and everything. I'll, I'll be the I'll be the uh, bright eyed bushy tail on the, on the whole conversation. I mean, there's a lot more people waking up to you know seeing what kind of more natural uh, I guess fixes, enhancements, uh, remedies, all that kind of stuff that they're, they're looking into instead of going so synthetic with everything, whether it's fertilizers, pest mm -hmm. controls, they're looking at more natural avenues. Their interest, people are more interested. And even kids, I know my kids are interested in, hey, what are the butterflies doing? Where do they eat? Where do they live? Where are they going? And, and they want to say, we want more. How do we get more? Um, and I think last year, uh, COVID really woke a lot of people up. Yeah. Because you know where people will never work before that? Outside. Yes. And now and last year, everybody went outside like, oh, hey, world. Yeah, you <laughs> probably use a little attention. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, and, I mean, in our, in our business, we've noticed, we've noticed a lot of that. Everybody came to the garden. They've never played it before. We want to get into it. What do we, what do, we do? Where do we start? Mm -hmm. um, and, and this year it continued. And so hopefully that, you know, there's a trajectory that's changed uh, in how, and how people, you know, interact with the environment, the yards, everything else moving forward. Mm -hmm. It really does make a difference. Um, there's another researcher at Washington University in St. Louis, Sasha Heath, who is looking at um, the effectiveness of St. Louis Audubon's Bring Conservation Home Program. And basically, you can get your um, property rated gold, uh, silver, bronze in terms of how friendly it is for birds. And she she found, she compared, and, and then she's also comparing it to, to just homes that aren't in the program. And she found it really does make a difference to, to be engaged in that program in terms of bird diversity. And you know, it, it's not solving climate change, but the better things are regardless, the better they are able to handle climate change. I know uh, there was an architect that uh, our design team uh, and I had lunch with last year. Um, and she was saying that there's a new trend. I can't remember the name of, of what it was, but there's a new trend uh, coming in the landscape architecture world where they're actually designing landscapes now to be more um, sustaining for the, you know, the bugs and all the little insects and everything mm -hmm. that are out there to help promote more of just, just a, a holistic ecosystem out there, not just planting natives, just planting plants in the right, um, in, the, in the right balance to promote these, uh, again, bugs and the insects and everything that you would typically see in a natural setting, which I was like, wow, that's really getting, that's really getting nitty gritty <laughs> into, into design. So it's, it's pretty intriguing to see everything coming. And it's exciting for me because I, back in 20, 2012, I had a, I just saw that this industry is just going to blow up because it, everything's going to be plants, everything's going to be green, and we're starting to see it. It's pretty exciting. I mean, as much as it is depressing and negative, there's a lot of excitement happening mm -hmm. in, in the plant world, a lot of excitement happening. Yeah, definitely. Well, can I ask you a question, Anthony? Yeah. Um, when you deal with, when you work with clients, are any of them mentioning climate in terms of what they're thinking about? Or like if they're planting something that could last a long time, like an oak tree or whatever, are they, they asking like, should I plant this one or this one, given that the future may or may not be suitable? For that tree or something that that question has that question has not come up yet because I, I don't think the general public uh i don't think that's on their minds i really don't as much as these people see it in the news even myself like for this conversation i, I mean i knew things were you know the, yeah, when i was a kid i always saw the i always saw the videos of shows eventually you know the part of california moving to alaska and the play <laughs> i mean but people don't think about that kind of future because everybody's so focused on the now mm -hmm. and not focused on the then uh, I mean, the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is everybody really focused on low maintenance, native, easy to maintain. Um, butterfly gardens are very popular. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit more with birds and how do we attract more birds? How do we attract more of the wildlife? How can we be more, and we've seen in some cases, even how do we build a landscape that we can get what we want with the color, the smells, the interaction, the four seasonal uh, um, interest, but yet have work with the deer and everything else that we have around them, which is a huge challenge, especially in West County, because um, uh, the deer just devour everything, even things you would never expect, they, they eat it. The only thing I just tried to choose a boxwood, but, <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's, probably, that's probably as close as, as I get to that question. I, I can say the same thing. I, we get you know hundreds of questions 
every year. And I have not really heard people talk about that, uh, you know, in terms of selecting plants for climate or anything. They are talking about, you know, native plants and things that for pollinators. So that's, that's where they're at right now. But um, in terms of climate, eh, not so much, but that's why we kind of have the climate garden so we can have that conversation that's understandable to, that's, you know, at the level of the homeowner and they can understand what's going on and what to think about, you know, for the future. So um, unfortunately, as we see, probably as we see more issues, we might have that conversation. <laughs> by that time, by that not, time, it's usually like, a little too late. <laughs> yeah, it's like, let's start right now, but. Yeah. So, yeah. so something, I mean, so I'm, I'm just had a thought in mind, and do you have like an interactive, um, model for what you're talking about where it shows that uh, climate zone being up in Canada do you have an actual like a like an, like a, like an info video or anything that, that shows that because that'd be something interest that'd be something I'd be interested in showing on our uh, our TV that we have in our garden center because that I think a lot of people would find a lot of interest in that that's a good question I've seen them but honestly I, I can't point you to one off the top of my head um, like where, you know, the growing zones are. Is that exactly. Right? In 2080, you can expect this, this, and this, and you'd be able to see how it changes mm -hmm. and what plants they might be able to expect in, you know, in St. Louis and, you know, 2080 and those kind of things. They're going to be like, wow, okay. I mean, because, I mean, pictures and videos are, I mean, it's worth, you know, it's worth, it's, that, that's where people are really going to see it. It's going to hit them between the eyes the most. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's a catch-22. I mean, that's why um, the climate garden that, Daria is talking about is so informative. Like maybe a tree can't live here right now, but a tree can live, you know, 80, 100 or more years. So you'd want to get it started in a kind of a safe little microclimate and then 30 years from now it'll be fine. Uh, and then, you know, 100 years from now, uh, it'll be enjoying things and, and, uh, and, and, and going well. So, it, you know, it's, do you plant things? I guess the question is how far in advance in a sense do you plant things? Mm -hmm. um, and then the other question is, what is going to be survivable 20 years down the road as opposed, to, I mean, how, how do you test that? So yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then I can say like, not necessarily for modeling, but the I think the Arbor Day Foundation had a graphic where they showed the USDA hardiness zones, like what they were, I think 20 years ago. And then they show what the projected look um, uh, shift is like, there's, it shows the actual shift of the zones. They're, we've increased by one, at least most of, I think the US, but it actually shows that. So it just play, it kind of does it on replay automatically, but it, it really hits home of where we're going. Like, you know, we're zone six, we're gonna be a zone seven and God forbid we get to zone eight. <laughs> and I guess the my last question is if, you know, I, I don't know how much we're faster or slower, but if, the plant was completely left alone, devoid of humans. How how much ahead are we from a natural warming? If there is a natural natural warming, because we were, you know, ice age one day, or you know, a year, thousands or millions of years ago, we were all subtropic. I mean, so what? Where where in the balance? I guess would we be if 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 we didn't have you know let's call it human uh, inter, uh, human intervention in the climate. That's a good question. Um, they have run climate models kind of ignoring the human component. What they found is we would be at like the peak warming right now or would have mm -hmm. been. Uh, and we may be starting to go back into something a little bit cooler because the ice, uh, the world does go through these ice age stages, mm -hmm. um, you know, about 100,000 know, years long or something like that. So we would have been kind of at the apex and then maybe slowly going back in. Um, but we are we're not holding steady. We're definitely, we're, we're going in the op exact opposite direction. I mean, we're going into a direction that hasn't been seen in the last 3 million years on the face of the earth. You know, it, the earth has been much warmer than it will be even in the hundred years from now. Um, but at that time, like very large portions of the planet were just completely uninhabitable. uninhabitable. I mean, think Sahara desert like conditions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, uh, the earth can withstand warmer temperatures, but what kind of earth is that? No, I, I, 100%, I, I, I got just questions popped in my head. I was curious about it. Well, I, Daria and Adam, I really appreciate you guys making the time. Uh, I mean, I, I've learned a lot. I got a lot of notes here. Um, I'm going to go to my garden center team and be like, hey, 
what kind of information can we get out there just to get people thinking about, you know, these kinds of questions, these kinds of things that, that, you know, we could be facing. Um, is there any social media or anything that you guys want to put out there that, that people you want people to follow or go to um, for more information again, or, or to, to contact you guys or anything along those lines? Yeah, um, actually, uh, if you have any other questions, we have a horticulture answer service. And so that uh, runs Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to noon. People can call in. It's a, um, so you can get your gardening questions answered. Or if you have any others, you can uh, ask us there. Um, we are a little short staffed, so timing is a little uh, it's not going to be exact, but we're trying. We're doing our best to get your uh, questions answered. You can just leave a message, or if you have any other questions, like gardening, like plant, what what is this pest on my plant, or what is this disease, or what's this insect, or any uh, recommendations of plants, um, you can also email us at plantinformation at mobot.org. M O B O T B as in boy. Um, plantinformation at mobot.org, um, and we can answer your gardening questions there. I would second what Daria said. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, thank you both very much. Appreciate you again, appreciate the time, appreciate the information, appreciate the conversation. I hope to uh, be in contact with you all soon and uh, go from there. Talk to you guys soon. All right. Thanks a lot, Anthony. Thank you.